When Fear is Not Afraid, Chapter 8 The hallway's carpet was threadbare and devoid of colour except for a nondescript brown, which he doubted was part of its original hue and more an accumulation of the sort of thing vacuum cleaners had been invented for. Wallpaper, originally on the wall, had peeled and fallen over the years to collect like autumn leaves along a skirting board. Some pieces had caught upon ornate lamps, which jutted like withered claws from wall, but only one of them worked, up until he wandered past it when its bulb fizzled and went pop. Not that it mattered, as there was ample light spilling in from streetlights outside, where cracks in walls were large enough to pass for windows. There was also evidence of rising damp so severe that it might be better described as reverse rain, and which, despite making the place smell like mud, nevertheless reduced the hotel's fire risk markedly. The lift wasn't working, so he took the stairs, which turned out to be just as broken and twice as dangerous. In the lobby, it was quiet, dark and dingy, and smelt like dead badger. It was, however, in a far better state of disrepair than upstairs, as recent fire damage had gone some way to drying the place. Wallpaper although in its more traditional location, was a collage of several patterns, including one that had been banned in more upmarket hotels for economic reasons. There was a wooden door on one side of the lobby so warped that it appeared to be solely responsible for supporting the upper floors. Beside it hung faded pictures which, although doing nothing for the lobby's ambience, did a great deal to cover up its missing masonry. In one corner were some armchairs arranged around a little table that was missing a leg, which accounted for their arrangement, while another had stools against a window overlooking the street outside. At least it would have done had it not been covered with brown paper and sticky tape. There was an empty aquarium in a large puddle, some pot plants dotted around the place, one of which was in a pot, and a poor scattering of magazines that were dated shortly after the invention of the printing press. Despite all this, Oscar felt it had the sort of rustic charm that was inevitable after having stayed in a hotel decorated with aerosol manure. Moreover, there were no other patrons present, which pleased him greatly. There was a dog behind a reception desk who appeared even less interested in Oscar's presence than the newspaper he was reading. He didn't look up. He hadn't looked up when Oscar had checked in earlier that afternoon either. He had given him a key, however, which turned out to be for appearances only, as none of the room's doors had locks and only three had hinges. Oscar approached the desk. I like what you've done with the place, he said. The dog continued reading. That is, inasmuch as you've clearly done nothing with it, it's quite a novel approach and lends the place an old-world charm, a sort of teetering fragility, though that might be the woodworm. I saw a rat earlier... Is it staying long? The dog's indifference was admirable. Oscar placed his key on the counter. You can have this back if you like, as I clearly shan't be needing it. The dog licked a claw and turned a page. Tell me, Oscar said, which is the quickest way to the inaugural halls of Lieb? Depend on where you are, the dog said, without looking up. Well, I'm here, in Lieb. Well, then it should be fairly quick, relatively speaking. Yes, but from this hotel. Which is the best way to get there? The dog shrugged. There is no best way. As with most things, there are both advantages and disadvantages. As opposed to this place, said Oscar, his indignation growing, which has only the latter. He wondered why every experience he's had checking into hotels ended up being harder than physically getting to them. So would you be good enough to advise me of the quickest route out of the myriad available? In a hurry, are you? The dog asked, turning to the following page. I am, actually. I think I spent too long fluffing my pantaloons. The dog glanced over the counter at them before returning to his page. Not long enough, if you ask me. Oscar shifted uncomfortably. Well, I'm not asking you. Then what are you doing at my desk? Another turn of page. Look, I need to get to the inaugural halls of Lieb almost immediately. 
Uh, you're a poet, are you? Well, not really, but I do need to get there. You won't need to get there unless you're a poet. Well, in a way, then, yes, I am a poet. Only the greatest poets are invited to the inaugural halls of Lieb, the dog said, frowning at one particular sentence. And such creatures would certainly not downplay their status in the manner you just did. The dog looked at him. Nor would they have sought accommodation in an establishment such as this. Establishment. You're actually comfortable using that word. I'm certainly more comfortable than you are, he said, returning to the paper. Judging by those pantaloons. Oscar fluffed them. Why? What's wrong with them? Well, they're bigger than you are for a start. It's the current fashion. The dog humphed. Where? In the dark? No, Asquith, actually. After a scoff, the key was taken and thrown into a shoebox containing several others and the newspaper perused again. Right, look, can you at least order me a taxi? I could. But the fact that you need one means you're not worthy of attending the lecture. I I beg your pardon? If you need a taxi, then you're clearly not a poet. Those worthy of attending the inaugural halls of Leib stay in much fancier hotels closer to the place. He glanced at Oscar with the sort of contempt that usually books sweets. If you're in this dump, it says far more about you than I need to. None of this was doing Oscar's confidence any good, and he considered going back to his room and staying there until the rot in the floorboards gave way and he returned to the lobby unconventionally. Look, he said, I would like a taxi all the same, and if that's too difficult, then I'll call one myself, if you have a telephone. Do you have a telephone? And by that, I mean one that works and isn't being used to prop up collapsed shelving. Another page was scrutinised. Your insistence on telephones and taxis proves that you know even less about poetry than I do. I see it all the time. Animals believing themselves to be worthy of the inaugural halls of leave just because they can rhyme a few words. Just get me a fluffing taxi, Oscar growled, before I pull you across the desk and use you to flag one down. The dog's indifference could have been nominated for an award. I shall not direct you to the inaugural halls of Leib, he said, because you are not worthy, and as for your threats to use me as a flag, he peered at Oscar's pantaloons again. Oh, they're rather hypocritical, considering you're wearing one. Whether you believe me or not, said Oscar, his teeth inseparable, I nevertheless have an appointment at the inaugural halls of Leib. Just because I have booked a room in the sort of place that's barely managing to house internal walls does not reflect my credibility as a poet. Of course it does. A gifted poet has pride enough to hire an abode worthy of such talent, not languish in a squalid cesspit like this. Oscar placed his paws on the counter and leant upon both, saying, I'll have you know that one of the best hotels I have ever stayed in was also one of the most disgusting. I rest my case. Your rationale is appalling, Oscar growled. I cannot believe you consider poetry to be related to pride. My case is now comatose. Poetry is about what one sees and feels. It's inherently introspective and has nothing to do with image. My case is now clinically dead and funeral arrangements are pending. Pride is the antithesis of poetry. It's been cremated, buried and resides within a box labelled Return to Sender. Oscar stared. You just don't get it, do you? And I suppose you believe the epitome of a poet is a creature such as the Dodotta set? Oh, quite the epitome indeed, the dog said. The animal is both artist and performer, a bard, no less. His whopping pride compliments his massive talent. Leaning across the counter, Oscar hissed, I not only know the Diderada set well, but can assure you that although he was once as arrogant as you suggest, he's come to realise conceit is the greatest hindrance to the art. The dog offered a lethargic chuckle and put down his newspaper. Oh, I'm sorry, but your claim of knowing the Diderada set is even more fantastic than your claim to be a poet. Oscar was about to say something more, before wondering whether the dog's impudence was a hobby. His own confidence was already cowering under the table already mentioned, and was contemplating a career change by becoming one of its legs. I don't need your help anyway, he said, leaving the desk. 
Finding your way may be difficult, the dog said, returning to his newspaper, considering how lost you are to begin with. Oscar stormed from the hotel and tried slamming its door. Because it didn't close very well to begin with, it rattled and fell off instead, which cheered him enormously, though he cringed when expecting the rest of the place to follow.